Rebecca is the main character in our portion this week. Described as barren in the opening verses, Rebecca nevertheless soon becomes pregnant with twins. Enduring a painful pregnancy, Rebecca seeks comfort from God, who responds by offering Rebecca prophecy. God tells her that the second born of the twins will be dominant. Later, Rebecca assures that the prophecy becomes reality. Rebecca learns that Isaac is about to offer his choicest blessing to the elder son, Esau, as soon as he hunts game and returns with the tasty dish for his dad. Rebecca springs into action. She disguises the younger son, Jacob, as Esau, prepares a dish to mimic the one that Esau is supposed to bring, and emboldens her younger son to deceive his father into bestowing onto him the blessing intended for Esau. Finally, as Esau threatens to murder Jacob for stealing his paternal blessing, Rebekah again takes control. She convinces Isaac and Jacob that the younger son must leave home and travel to her hometown there to find a suitable wife. Even though virtually all the action throughout the portion is initiated by Rebecca, the reading begins, This is the legacy of Isaac, son of Abraham. Leaving out not only Rebecca, but Isaac's own beloved late mother, Sarah. Are we to learn that the story of, is of a patriarchal line with women's roles thrust aside? Soon, Isaac pleads with the Eternal on behalf of his wife, for she was childless. Now briefly, Isaac is the actor, or so it seems. The ancient rabbis are not so sure. Why, after all, would only the husband pray when the couple is unable to conceive? In Midrash, we learn that rather than praying on behalf of his wife, Isaac prays facing Rebecca, and she is praying too. Wow. The ancient rabbis give voice to a woman at a moment when she seems to be silent in the Torah. Rather remarkable for a group of men writing 2,000 years ago. Unfortunately, it doesn't last. In the very next verse, Suffering a painful pregnancy, Rebecca went to inquire of the Eternal, who responds to her with a revelation about the children. The rabbis, though, are not prepared to imagine a direct encounter between God and a woman. They say, for example, that she seeks divine guidance at the Tent of Ever, a distant ancestor of the family who is imagined to be operating a Torah study academy. Rebecca is demoted to receiving the critical divine guidance from men, even though Torah explicitly introduces the prophecy with the Eternal One said to her. My conclusion developed 30 years ago when I wrote my rabbinic thesis on the Midrash on Rebecca, is that the sages could not imagine this matriarch to be silent. But at the same time, they couldn't stand for a woman to be in direct communication with God. Rebecca, as the prime actor in this story, can't just be sitting there while Isaac prays for his child. Yet for a group of exclusively men interpreting God's will for the Jewish people, the notion that a woman might have direct access to God is unacceptable. What the rabbis do to Rebecca is not all that different from what we now understand as mansplaining. This group of men explains that Rebecca cannot have had the encounter she experienced with God, but must have learned from men. I do see the irony in the fact that I, a man, am about to describe denounce, and suggest remedies to mansplaining. So let me explain in the words of a woman. 
a reporter, Laura Rutherford Morrison. When a man mansplains something to a woman, he interrupts or speaks over her to explain something she already knows. Indeed, something in which she may already be an expert, on the assumption that he must know more than he, she does. When men interrupt or presume to correct a woman who is speaking of her own experience or, or expertise, they are implying that she is ignorant, that she is incapable of having authoritative knowledge. They are saying, essentially, shh, I know best. A cosmopolitan reporter, Gina May, asked women for infuriating examples of mansplaining. The responses flowed freely. I once had a friend mansplain to my roommate how to correctly pronounce her own name because he thought she was doing it wrong. <coughs> At the racetrack, where I've worked for 14 years, men regularly try to explain to me how gambling works as I take their bets. Obstetrician disagreed that my baby was about to come. Mansplained and left for soda. Three minutes later, baby born. No doc in room. The last example may seem problematic. After all, the man is a physician trained in his specialty. The woman in labor is not a physician. Mansplaining to women about their own bodies, though, is on every list that women provide when they describe their frustrations with mansplaining. Moreover, it's relevant to our biblical example. It's as if the rabbinic sages are telling Rebecca the prophecy about the fetuses in your womb can't have come to you directly. Men must have communicated it. The good news is that we can do something about mansplaining. Rutherford Morrison agrees that the vast majority of men don't wake up and think, Gosh, I wonder how I can devalue women's experiences today. I have been guilty. We men do need to be more mindful. A well-known example from our tradition may help us to elevate women's voices. When we discuss the song of the sea, Micha Mocha, praising God's saving power, we often recall that Miriam lifted up her voice and led the Israelites in that song. That description does not fully reflect Torah's, where the song is introduced. Then Moses sang, and the Israelites sang this song to the Eternal. Only after the 19th century, 19th, excuse me, the 19th, after, only after the 19th verse song is complete do we read, then Miriam the prophet picked up a hand drum and all the women went out after her in dance, and Miriam chanted for them. I do not know why I always thought Miriam to be the leader long before I started reading the Torah seriously, but that was years before Debbie Friedman wrote the song that reinforces Miriam's leading role. Now that song has popularized Miriam's primary place in the narrative and her designation as a prophet across generations. In reading Parshat Toldot, our sages offer us two models. Raising up the voices of women when they are implausibly absent and degrading women's voices when they are deemed out of place. Let us affirm one of these examples and resolutely reject the other. When we do not hear women's voices, let us listen harder. Then let us celebrate every voice that is raised, pleading with Rebecca and rejoicing with Miriam. Amen.